Hey people, so we've got uh, the HP EDBooker uh, 855G7 here. It's a 2020 model of HP's really popular 15.6 inch business laptop. You'll probably see this in large companies, in schools, and it's generally supposed to be really reliable. It's comparable to the ThinkPad T series, the Dell's Latitude series, especially their 5 or 7000 lineup. This year, you have the option for the up to 8 core Ryzen 4000 series processor, one of the main highlights. Additionally, there's two RAM slots, so you can go all the way up to 64. If you think of the earlier ThinkPad releases, those laptop, it was either onboard plus um, one RAM, which is user accessible, or two RAM slots on the ThinkPad L14, but that's a lower end laptop. So on this one, a little bit more optionality for upgrading, just in case you need to later. Still, the really dead book like design, especially around the corners. This chassis is more compact on either side, more elegant chassis, thinner screen betters. Still a business laptop, quite obvious that the design language has got more modern. Immediately what you'll probably notice is just how much difference there is at the front. If you look at the top of the lid, then it's quite obvious that the G7, they've made it more compact, particularly on the bottom. So it's a little bit more about you focusing on your content and less about you looking at the black bezel. That's quite nice. On the G7, this feel of the keyboard, it's still very typical of the HP EDBook series. It doesn't give you as much feedback as some of the other business laptops. I think after two, three days, you quite quickly get used to it. At first, the impression might be a little bit spongy. On the inside, some small changes to the keyboard. Probably most noticeably, the power button has changed onto the keyboard. I always personally prefer the dedicated standalone button. By taking that space, it does mean that there is a slightly different layout, so the teleconferencing options have been replaced. It's slightly odd timing because Lenovo has recently just added the teleconferencing options to their laptop. The keyboard layout otherwise seems very similar to before. On the older G5 and G6 model, you used to be able to service the keyboard, replace it very easily if needed. On the new G7, the keyboard requires um, you to remove the motherboard to access, so it's quite a lot more difficult to service. Same fingerprint placement. Very little difference in the clearance level, as you can see here. But once we zoom upwards, you will notice that um, the size difference is really there. On the G7 here, as you can see, the lid is in a concave shape. So opening it is actually quite easy. However, on the older model, as you can see, it's some um, very edgy shape. So it's, um, it's less comfortable. So it's definitely improvement. It's quite impressive that with one finger, I can move the lid. It feels very firm at the same time. As soon as it let go, it settles in the place. There's very little give and it feels quite secure. I At the center of the keyboard, there just doesn't feel to be any flex, just in case anybody was wondering. Yeah, it's very quality construction. On the left hand side, it's really tidy, you can see smart card reader, audio jack, um, just a type A USB as well. On the right hand side, you can see the second type A USB port, HDMI, USB C, two of them. Neither of them are Thunderbolt. If you didn't configure with the SIMS card, you'll notice that this part is blocked. Most recent 850 units haven't had the card reader. The ports on the G7, in order to achieve the more slim design, took a step sideways. Most significantly, you lose the docking connector, and additionally, on the G7, you also no longer have the Ethernet port. The latter will be quite a big loss for some users. You do gain one of the USB-C port, but keep in mind, Ryzen at the moment does not support Thunderbolt 3, so it's just a USB-C port. Of course, on the Intel version of the 850G7, um, this will be less of an issue. Nonetheless, on the AMD version, you will have a slightly newer version of the HDMI port, the version 2. On the other side, the lock slot is now a little bit smaller, so it's just finding the right accessories to go with. Opening it with one hand from any angle is a little bit easier than before. It's not totally easy because you can see it sliding in the first attempt. Whereas by comparison, on the older model, if you were to try to open it with one hand, it's actually quite awkward unless you try to open it at the middle where there is this cutout. I mean, to be clear, it's probably safer to open with both hands um, just in case it slides off the table. Having lined up the three units on this side, that the new G7 is noticeably more compact. We've lined up the edge, and as you can see, the T15 in the middle is probably the more thick unit. It's also longer. So the new chassis on the G7 has definitely 
shrunk in comparison. Another feature which I really like about the new G7 is that the heat exhaust on the laptop has moved from the side onto just under the screen. What this means is the hot air doesn't exhaust from the side of the laptop anymore. It exhausts from this position. It's away from your hands, importantly. So if you're using a mouse, it doesn't get in the way. Looking from the base, you can see that the rubber feet on the bottom helps to protrude the laptop upwards slightly. So this cooling design probably means that more air needs to be put from underneath the laptop. The Ryzen model seems to be relatively easy to cool, so perhaps that's less of a concern. Overall, I think it's really nice to move the vent away. With metallic chassis, it's always down to personal preference whether you like it or not. I mean, personally, I'm always preferring a more rubberized um, feel so it doesn't get too cold. Whereas some people will probably prefer the more metallic finish, which looks more elegant. It's uh, down to personal preference. These um, rubber feet, uh, hopefully they're durable, going to help to keep the laptop flat if they're durable. On the edge, the casing can be really precise in the way it is shaped. It also means that if it's dropped, it will leave a very, very noticeable mark. Five screws to take off the base cover to access the internals. Okay, firstly, you'll notice the single heat pipe leading to the fan. This is Ryzen 5 model, so we don't know if the Ryzen 7 might have a slightly more beefy cooling solution. On the T footing from Lenovo, for instance, you have the dual heat pipe of the 4G. As you can see, there is no 4G cable here, and there's a one single M2 slot, and it's a 56 watt hour battery. There's a metal shroud covering the RAM, so you've got to, with some care, take off the metal shroud. There is a HP support video. Generally, quite straightforward service, it seems. Looking from the outside, you can see there's one side with a fan, and the other side, I think it's just to enable some airflow if needed. Whilst running heavier CPU plus GPU workload, which is the heaven benchmark at the moment, you'll see the center of the laptop is quite hot, as it is the exhaust here. It remains reasonably manageable on the Ryzen 5, expecting the Ryzen 7 motor to perhaps get a little bit more hot. It's within the workable threshold, and with the air exhausting here, it doesn't exhaust onto your hand. The rest of the air intake, although they're quite large, it's effectively this area that puts the air and exhausts it here in the gap under the display. The rest of the base remains fairly manageable in the temperature. We've got the Ryzen 5 model. The temperature is reasonably decent. Um, we don't know if the Ryzen 7 model will be much hotter. It's a metallic chassis, so if it does get hot, perhaps to put on a desk. Whilst running the battery test, you can see the center of the laptop as well as the top right where the air exhausts from inside the laptop. Uh, it's a little bit more warm than the other parts. Perfectly manageable temperature here. And keep in mind the workload is not totally light. And quite nicely, the palm rice doesn't get too toasty. And as you can see, this is where the air tends to get sucked in. And the base of the laptop remains in fairly reasonable temperature. So that's quite nice. This bit gets a little bit hot. It might not be something you want to put um, on your lap for an extended amount of time, uh, taking into account that it's a 15.6 inch laptop, so it's not a 14 inch. Probably better have it on desk. Anyway. We're running uh, five news tabs, which refresh every 20 seconds each. Um, YouTube 1080p, uh, Spotify playing without the speakers, backlight is off. As you can see, three hour and 45 minutes into this video, we're down to 50%. That extrapolates back to about seven and a half hours battery life, so between seven and eight. Worth mentioning, the average CPU power use during this time averaged is 3.7 watts. So overall, it's actually quite impressive. So seven to eight hours in the lighter workload, when you start to stress a laptop, it can go down really quickly. If you fully stress it, I suspect it will probably be gone within one or two hours. So your mileage may vary, as I say. So let's take a look at the spec and what it's like to use the machine. With the Ryzen 5, you get 12 threads, and obviously there's an option for even faster Ryzen 7, 8 cores, and 16 threads. I suspect for many people, the Ryzen 5 Pro would actually be a very decent option, uh, more cores than the Intel equivalent, almost comparable single thread performance. In the everyday usage, I don't think there's going to be as much difference between the Intel and AMD. Interestingly, HP only advertises 32 gig of RAM support, but um, as you can see here, we've got um, 64 gig and um, HP support assistant. You can see it's a AMD model. So more RAM is definitely supported. This is uh, two times 32. We've only got the store RAM at the moment, but I suspect it probably can run faster if um, you put 3200 RAMs into this. Ryzen is quite memory frequency dependent, so faster RAM might give you more performance in some context. SSD. And there's a base AC Wi-Fi option, and there's a preferred Intel Wi-Fi 6. 
I'm a little bit surprised that we received this um, rather than the Intel option, but the Intel option is going to be um, preferred. The Vega graphics is not quite as powerful as um, the one in the Ryzen 7 we've seen from the Heaven benchmark. It's really nice that HP has kept the RAM as user upgradable, whilst giving people the opportunity to get Ryzen 7 as well. We haven't really seen a refresh from Dell, so the only alternative really at the moment is Lenovo. This RAM approach, more open approach, is definitely appreciated. This is webcam footage, um, just so we have a better idea um, what the webcam is like. Uh, it's quite well lit at the moment, so one um, light there and one light there. Immediately, one of the first thing you notice is uh, sort of black hair. It's not entirely black, and I don't have gray hair, but um, no, it's it. it Anyway, um, this um, also should be black, but it's not quite there. You can see some of the correction of the color and contrast um, automatically happening, um, but it doesn't seem to, um, and also there's some noise. If I try to move to the edge of the frame, let's see if there's some um, degradation in the detail. You can definitely see more noise around the edge of the frame, but, you know, it's, it's a small sensor. But also if I'm on the edge of the frame, and if I move back to the center, I think the stu studio effect by the mic, it takes a little while to follow back to me. Um, I'm not sure if I'm just overthinking. Now, if I hold up to um, plant, um, even person, it's a lot more vivid um, than what I um, can see on the screen, so it's a little bit more washed up on the screen. Um, here's uh, some more fruit, just to give you a better idea of the color. So I mean, one simple explanation is that maybe the webcam doesn't really cope as well with um, too much light. So I'll just go, go and um, edit one light off. Uh, so now back, yeah, so as you can see, it's uh, even more noise. So I think having more light definitely helped, um, as opposed to less light. light. Um, but yeah, no, it's still quite washed out. Um, hopefully next year they can put in better webcam, but um, you know, for the average Zoom call, it's perfectly adequate. Okay, so we're in the work pod. So it's, um, this is um, probably closer to your normal average evening at home light, whereas earlier that was more studio light effect. So this is going to be closer to what we'll probably get. Um, so, you know, it's um, a lot less detail, I think, than earlier. If we just put it into a slightly dimmer setting, um, let's see. Yeah, so it's uh, even less detail. Um, now, if we put it onto presentation mode, yeah, it's it's a lot less detail. So it's um, you know it's it's perfectly workable for the average zoom, but you need you certainly need light for things to work. Webcam privacy shutter. It used to be easier to open, but it was looked stuck on almost. Whereas now it's a lot more natural. It has a distinctive um, look. It's quite useful for business laptop. The speaker is actually reasonable, a little bit better than expected. Could do with more bass. The mid is quite clear and the high frequency sometimes struggles slightly and distorts a little bit but i think that's more of the case with any laptop you can hear some of the sound coming through the grill here and from the top it's um, quite a metallic build you will also be able to hear some of the noise um, coming from the base cover so oscillating slightly here it's quite normal i think we've attached a few clips i don't really know if they work On the Elitebook series, there tends to be quite a few display options. We're certainly not short of options. Um, I think I can see a bot for displays here. There's probably more or less, depending on your region and availability. 250 nits is a decent starter panel. Uh, you probably want something slightly brighter if you intend to work outdoors. So that will be um, the 400 nits low power display. So that one should give you a good mix of um, energy efficiency and also having something slightly brighter. This looks quite compelling on the surface. What I'll probably say is um, HP Surview, that's their privacy panel. I generally think those panels have a slightly less contrast and slightly less optimal viewing angle. So unless you really need the privacy or really need some um, additional brightness 
with some clear trade-off in the image quality, then I generally steer away from the privacy screen. That's just me personally. Um, there's going to be a touch screen option as well. Um, although it's only 250 nits, um, wish it were a little bit brighter. What I'll probably also add is at the moment, there seems to be some shortage on Ryzen laptops. It might be the one you really want is not going to be available with the screen option that you want. There's some improvising on the buying side, I think. Hopefully it gets a little bit better next year. But um, yeah, it's we've got the 250 nits. It works. And I think if you want to have better image quality, you can always get an external screen. So, you know, it's um, finding what works for you. We've got the very standard 250 nits for HD IPS display with a standard webcam. Nice matte finish, good color. And I think we're lucky in that this one has very minimal backlight bleed. Good color uniformity. The color re reproduction won't be quite as stunning as those 4K panels that you see with really high color gamut, but it's fine for the day-to-day -day average stuff. 250 nits, I think, honestly, indoors is probably fine. It would be useful if HP has added a 300 nits option in between the 250 and 400. With laptop screen, there's some variation to the quality because um, a manufacturer often multi-sources. So even if I have a quite nice screen here, it doesn't necessarily mean that is the same case across. Um, just like if this display had backlight bleed, then on another unit, you could have a really good screen. But generally, it's all due for the office stuff. I really like the Cinebench R23 because it makes monitoring um, the power use over time quite simple. We're running a 10 minutes sort of test. As you can see, it's 24 at the moment, just under 25. But the average throughout this time has been 24.3. I can just spot hear the noise ramping slightly. It's a Ryzen 5 system, so it's not going to be as are hungry and um, emit as much, much heat. Still, I think it's probably, you're going to notice a difference more when it's CPUs plus GPU. Okay, just about finishing now. As you can see, we finished and it's just finishing this last loop. Getting a sense that the power usage will probably be around 24.5 or 25, something similar when it's just a CPU bond. It seems everybody and their pet is benchmarking rides in these days, so we're just going to go easy here. Just going to look at the baseline 256 and um, Ryzen 8 gig of RAM spec. Not going to change it. We're running the latest BIOS and factory image, but this could change by the time you watch it. It's quite interesting. We found that HP seemed to have three distinctive power levels. So when you're plugged in, you seem to roughly get one performance range. When you're on battery, it's a little bit less fast. And when you're on battery and selected best battery mode, it's even less fast. With Lenovo, we've um, on the Ryzen 7 models at least, we've seen that performance degradation as you sort of reduce the power level is very fine-tuned. With HP instead, you seem to get fewer performance range, so maybe some people would argue that's more consistent. What we would probably say is that looking at this um, graph, it's very limited data, but um, it's the single core performance seemed to be very up there with the Ryzen 7. So that's quite uh, impressive, especially considering it's not going to cost you as much. Of course, keep in mind, this chart is not like for like, it's um, not do channel, it's Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7. If anything, think of the L14 figures here as what it could be. Also keep in mind, L14 is slower probably than the L15, marginally. So just to summarize, the major difference brought by the G7 generation is going to be on the AMD side, certainly the um, Ryzen processor. So generation on generation, that's quite a performance boost. Performance-wise, for the everyday stuff, uh, the Intel is um, going to be still there. Uh, it's just really when you go to multitasking stuff, the AMD Ryzen will really stretch its legs, so to speak. Um, unlike Lenovo, HP has chose to refresh the chassis, and I really like the new compact chassis. It's um, substantially more compact than before. Thinner screen bezels, improved fan placement, um, so the hot air doesn't exhaust onto your hand. That's quite nice. Uh, keyboard's still decent. The trackpad, I wish it were a little bit less clicky, but you know, that's what you get. Uh, you can always use an external mouse. Anything else? If I could articulate any downside, then clearly it would be around the ports. So, I mean, Elibook of this class generationally hasn't had the card reader internally. So it would be something you probably have to have um, via external card reader. You know, it's 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 fine. Um, and um, both docking and ethernet port has been removed on this generation. Uh, uh, that's um, interesting. It's really related to Ryzen and the lack of Thunderbolt 3 support, which further exacerbates this situation a little bit. If it were a case of having Thunderbolt 3 on a similar system, then it would just be much more easy to overlook these port changes. 
one thing I'll probably say about the battery is it's just better than expectation. It uh, would be an understatement. When I initially got the reading, I was kind of surprised. I thought maybe I put it into a less demanding, you know, setting. But, you know, it turns out that it genuinely seem to be very power efficient. I suspect if we run less linear workload or if we fully stressed it, you know, um, within what, two, three hours, it would be gone. But that's more extreme end of the workload. But for the lighter and medium stuff, the Ryzen 4000 series really, really does seem to give them, you know, some boost to some heavier workload. Um, looking at some reviews, Intel stuff is um, supposed to be really good for the really light workload. I suspect when more reviews come out, for instance, on notebook checks, it would be good to get a sense how those more um, methodical people um, place it. It, I would certainly imagine that with the next generation of Ryzen, it probably goes even further. If at the beginning of this year you said this is a performance boost you get, I'd be surprised. Now, with the recent Apple announcement, you might ask, does this really change anything? I, my answer is probably no, because yes, it's going to be really performative, but Apple is still very much a premium brand. Their stuff only would appear in the Macs. And until the moment, I suspect when the Air or Air gets an even cheaper version alternative, it's still going to be quite costly. Just telling people get an iPad is probably not quite enough when they want a laptop. If um, AMD keeps progressing, then it's probably taking the box of um, is this good enough? If it's a tick for a while, AMD would have some promise. Intel, we'll see what they're doing with the Tiger Lake next year. Should be um, promising. Anyway, we've um, clearly overrun, but uh, thank you for watching. Thanks.